and some of you may not. Yeah, my name is Neil Folds, and of course we have one account time. In terms of our business, I'll just tell you a little bit about one account thing first of all. So we work with owner managed businesses uh, who have a problem with uh, the business not giving them the life that they want. What we like to do is to help them to focus on what's important and organize their finances. Uh, and we do that so that they feel more in control. And hopefully that means that they have more fun and make more money. This is a picture of our office. We're just around the corner from the Dean Bridge in Edinburgh, which is about five minutes away from Haymarket Station. So we're fairly central, uh, been right in the, the absolute centre of Edinburgh. What I'm going to do is just take you through what we're going to cover today. It's by no means meant to be an exhaustive list of all the, the tax saving opportunities, and we'll only really skim over uh, some of the, the areas as well. So it's not particularly in depth, but what it's supposed to do is to give you some ideas. Uh, and if there's some of the, the items on here that you either haven't heard of before or maybe hadn't considered, then we'll have done our job. And of course, if you're interested in discussing any of them in a bit more depth, then please feel free to contact us. So the things that we're going to cover are use of relatives, uh, unused personal allowances, pension contributions, timing of annual investment allowances, R&D tax credits, enhanced capital allowances, green cars, clearing overdrawn directors loan accounts, capital allowance claims on buildings, associated and group companies, and specific provisions. So I thought first of all, even if we just cover off the, the basics with you, this is really just to give you an idea of the <coughs> the corporation tax rate and the profit bands that they're actually applicable to. What's quite interesting is that certainly in recent years there hasn't been much change in the, the rate applicable to small companies, which is basically profits under 300,000. But the main rate has been coming down gradually and it's expected that in 2015-16, certainly in the, the current announcements, that the, the rates will converge with each other, so there won't be any differential. That has a, a bit of an impact in the way that we think about potentially associated or, or group companies, and I'll come on to that later on. So the first thing, in terms of small companies and SMEs, certainly in loan and managed businesses, it's not uncommon at all for the the director and possibly the shareholder uh, to be paid a, a small salary and then taking the rest of the money out by way of dividend. And the benefit of that, of course, is that national insurance isn't payable on dividends. However, it might be possible that if there's another family member who hasn't used up all of their personal allowances, that they could be employed in the business, do something useful, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, it could be a part-time rate, for instance, and that will allow them to use up their personal allowance and also for the, the business to claim a corporation tax deduction because they're a, a salaried employee. So the, the things to think about, I guess, are you know, what could you be doing uh, which might make your life easier in the business. And in terms of the advantages, well, the actual individual who's been employed, they're then getting national insurance credit, so effectively they're building up their national insurance history as long as they're being paid above the, the lower earning threshold. There's lower corporation tax for the business because any salary that the individual has been paid is deductible for corporation tax. And of course there'll be no additional income tax or national insurance for the individual as long as the, the salary is at a sufficiently low level and that they don't have a, a lot of income from elsewhere. One of the things to be aware of uh, is just that whatever rate they're, they're being paid, that, that should be above the, the minimum wage. I've just given a, a brief example here of how that would work. So if you look at the employer's national insurance threshold, so that's basically the level at which there's no national insurance payable by the employer, and the, uh, the employee threshold is actually just very slightly higher. Uh, so in the past, these 
these tended to be roughly about the same amount as the personal tax allowance, but over the last few years, the tax allowance has been growing a bit quicker than the employers and the, the national insurance thresholds have. So now they sit a bit below what the personal tax allowance would be. Uh, if we look to this situation for 2013-14, no, 7696 is the, the salary that could be earned before any employer's national insurance is payable. The minimum wage for a, a 21 year old is £6.31. So that equates to about 23 hours a week that somebody could be working in your business. So again, you know, that, that could be a son, daughter, it may be a wife if uh, they're not earning an amount above that 7696 elsewhere. And in terms of the savings that that generates, well, for corporation tax, at the small company rate, you'd be saving £1,539, and at the larger company rate, you'd be saving £1,739. Well, I mean, it's do that. The next one I'd like to look at is pension contributions. Again, a, a lot of people will understand that uh, a pension contribution is, is tax deductible for corporation tax. There's a couple of things that we, we need to just be aware of and look at carefully. So if you're making a large pension contribution, say to a director, then one of the things that we need to make sure is that it's proportionate and reasonable in comparison to other similar employees. Now, an owner-managed business, that's often very difficult because there isn't necessarily another employee who will be performing the same duties. Uh, so what we want to do there is just to look in comparison to other directors of one of managed businesses, does it seem fair and reasonable in terms of the, the package that they have? And part of the reason that we want to do that is really just to make sure that HMRC doesn't have any opportunity to argue that the, the pension payment was out of proportion to the, the duties that are being performed, and then they may argue that it wasn't wholly and exclusively for the purposes of the trade. It's a, it's a difficult argue, argument for them, and I think it's quite an easy one for us to defend uh, based on levels of remuneration, and as long as the, the company is profitable and it, it's able to demonstrate that that's a reasonable amount, then that should be fine. Where people get caught out sometimes is in the timing of the, the pension payment. And so the pension deduction it can only be claimed in the period that it's actually paid. And paid means that it's physically got to come out of the bank account. So where you need to be aware is if, for instance, you're writing a cheque for your pension contribution, which is fairly close to your company year end, then make sure that it's been banked and cashed prior to the year end. Uh, it's, it's really important that there are occasionally ways to get around it, but it is very uh, cumbersome. So it's much, it's much cleaner just to make sure that the payment is actually out of your bank account before the year end and then it's demonstrably being paid within that year. Another area to consider in pensions, if you're making fairly large pension contributions, then the actual annual allowance limit is falling from 50,000 to 40,000 next year. However, you can still take account of unused allowances from prior years, from the prior three years, which means that you can make a substantially higher payment than it may initially first appear based on the allowance for that particular year. I've put a, a link to an HMRC website uh, on the, the screen here, and it allows you to enter the amounts of payments that you're making, and it shows you the brought forward allowances which, which you're maintaining year on year. Uh, and it's actually very useful to be able to see the maximum amount of pension contribution that you, you can put in in any one year. The next thing I'd like to cover is the timing of annual investment allowances. An annual investment allowance is really, and it's given against any uh, equipment purchases that you make. So basically, plant and machinery, fixtures and fittings, uh, vans that you, you buy in the business. And it allows the, them to be fully tax deductible in the year that they were, they were purchased. So if we have a look at the timing of it, one of the things that's uh, with annual investment allowance is it has changed, certainly uh, over a number of years, 
it's both gone up and fallen. So it's been as low as £25,000 a year. At the moment, it's sitting at £250,000 a year, which is a, a, you know, a substantial difference. Uh, and that's going to be sitting like that. It started on the 1st of January 2013, and it'll be like that for two years. <coughs> so one, one of the things that we need to be careful of with annual investment allowances is if your company year-end spans one of the periods where the allowances change, so for instance, if you had a 30th of June year-end, then that would have mean for your 12, 13 uh, corporation tax year that you would have half a year at the £25,000 allowance and half a year at the £250,000 allowance. So again, it can be quite, uh, it needs to be carefully considered in terms of when actual spend is taking place, particularly if it's close to the end of your, your tax year. So we'd often advise that if you're going to make a capital spend and it's just after the end of the tax year, then why not bring it forward into the, the current tax year, which is going to accelerate the, the corporation tax deduction that you get. You'll get it a year earlier. But the other area that we need to look at and be careful of is where there's groups of companies, so that the allowances for the whole group rather than for each individual company. And again, it often means that, for instance, if there's a company which has a loss-making position but has some capital spend, it may well be better to allocate all of the allowance to another company within the group which is making money and which also has capital spend. Uh, and it's, it's up to the taxpayer to decide how that's going to be allocated or this is an association with that, that accountant. Uh, but the, there's no definitive uh, set of rules that HMRC used to say that you can allocate the, the allowance where you would be most beneficial for you to use it. Another thing that we would advocate in terms of uh, when capital purchases are made, there's a division between plant and machinery and also what's called integral features. Integral features tend to be things that are almost part of the, the fabric of a building. So things like the electrical systems, cold water systems, heating systems, ventilation lifts, uh, and also external solar shaving. So the, with integral features, the annual allowance that's given is actually lower than it is for plant and machinery. So again, in terms of the annual investment allowance, it's much better to claim that against integral features, first of all, because they're not going to be written off from a tax point of view as quickly as some of the other equipment. So again, particularly where there's a, a sort of largest refurb that's taking place, maybe of a building, then it's quite uh, important that these points are, are considered. Now, the next thing I'd like to go through is R&D tax credits. Now, often when we speak to business owners about this, they think, well, I'm not going to be, uh, this isn't any use for me because it, it's white coat stuff and we, we don't do any white coat research and development. It, it's quite important to just try and broaden out the, the scope of it and understand what it can actually cover. So it's a lot more than just pure white coat research. Uh, things like process improvements can qualify as well. The way that the scheme works, uh, certainly there's, there's a large scheme and a small scheme. For the SME, the, the smaller scheme, basically for every £100 of eligible expenditure that you incur on either process improvement or research and development, then there's a notional spend of £125 is claimed against corporation tax on top of that. So effectively, for each £100 that you spend, you're claiming a tax deduction of £225. Uh, that can also be substituted in some cases for cash back from HMRC. So for instance, if your business isn't profitable and it's making losses because it may be in the startup stage, then it's possible to substitute the loss that you would be carrying forward uh, which has been created by the, the R&D tax credits to receive cash, and that can be up to 11% of the eligible loss, which is actually paid back by HMRC. If we have a look at the, the types of things that HMRC will look at uh, for an R&D tax credit, then it's what is the scientific or, scientific or technological advance, what were the scientific or technological uncertainties, how and when were the uncertainties overcome? And why was the knowledge being sought not readily 
producible by a competent professional. So really, the, in some respects, demonstrating that there's been failure in a project is actually quite a good thing because it means that it wasn't necessarily easy to do. Uh, and that can be a, a sign that there's been research and development taking place. Again, it's important to keep an open mind in terms of the areas that you're thinking about. So some of the, the ones that have been uh, a bit eye-opening for us, uh, the one that always sticks in my mind is that a baker that had claimed an R&D tax credit for reducing the salt in their pies. So if you, if you bear that in mind, I'm sure it's one that will stick with you. Uh, that's certainly one, you know, if you think about that, that the scope is probably much wider than you would envisage. So even things like, you know, potentially new packaging that you might be putting into a product, uh, depending on why that's been done, then that may well be eligible for R&D as well. And we've had some success with software development too, where the R&D tax credits have been claimed for that as well. I'm going to go through now is enhanced capital allowances. So th these really work alongside annual investment allowances and they're, they're really aimed at uh, providing a, a benefit where effectively green equipment or energy saving plant and machinery is being purchased. Uh, the benefit that they have is that they, they can be claimed alongside the annual investment allowance. So you can't claim the same allowance on two pieces of equipment but for instance, if you had a, a relatively big refurbishment that you were doing and your annual investment allowance had been exceeded, then it may be possible to claim the enhanced capital allowance on some of the bits of, of kit that had been purchased, which basically ups the level of corporation tax deduction that you can have. And there's a list of the, the equipment, uh, and I'll put the, the web link here. And it's some examples of the type of equipment that can qualify. It's, it's a relatively broad range, but things like boilers, pipe work, insulation, refrigeration equipment uh, can potentially all qualify. So I think the important, the important part here is really at the planning stage is to be thinking about this because it may be that you swap from one boiler type to another. Uh, if the cost differential isn't, you know, isn't too high, then you may find that you're able to get a, a much better capital allowance and tax deduction based on the, the slightly greener bit of equipment as compared to one that was potentially in the, the spec originally. Uh, but it's really just thinking about these things as early in a project as possible. Net number six, I'd like to have a, a, a look at green cars. So, Company cars are, I guess, to a certain extent, have sort of fallen out of fashion a little bit just because the, the personal tax that was attached to them is fairly substantial in some cases. However, HMRC has been keen to, I guess, drive the, the use of green cars. And so at the moment, there's a 100% first year allowance uh, for zero emission cars. And the eligibility for that is they have to have less than 95 grams per kilometer of emissions. And that will go up until 31st of March 2015. Uh, electric cars also qualify. Uh, so it needs to be a new car. But certainly if you're, if you're considering changing a car and you are willing to consider you know, a low emission car uh, or a, an electric car, then it can certainly tip the balance between thinking about it as a personal car as opposed to a company car. And it, it may well be because of the first year allowances, it's always worth doing the calculations to see how they, they stack up. But certainly at the moment, because of the first year allowance, you may find that it's, it's more beneficial to run that car through the company than it is to have it as a, a personal vehicle, which is probably the, the opposite from where cars have been over the, the last few years. Next, I'd like to look at overdrawn directors' loan accounts. Uh, technically, the, the tax as such isn't really corporation tax, although it gets paid along at the same time as your corporation tax, and it, it's known as 455 tax. And so basically, with a, a director has an overdrawn loan account, HMRC takes the view that <coughs> they don't want that to be there indefinitely, as it would be an easy way for people to take money out of a company without it being taxed. So, if the loan is still in place or still overdrawn nine months after the year end, then a 25% tax levy 
which is paid along with your corporation tax, uh, is due on that overdrawn loan amount. Uh, it can be avoided if, if you're overdrawn at the end of the year and the loan is cleared within nine months of the year end, then the Section 455 tax doesn't have to be paid. In the past, it was possible to clear a loan and then a few days later potentially reinstate that loan by drawing down a, another new amount. That isn't any longer the case. The, the rules were changed on that. So there's a 30-day rule now that basically prevents that type of bed and breakfasting arrangement where a loan is repaid and then a new loan is taken within 30 days. In terms of director's loans, it's always well worth having them documented properly. Uh, and certainly, you know, looking at how they're cleared, that could be a, a mixture of, it could be a, a loan write-off, it could be uh, dividend payments, it could be the payment of a, a bonus. All of these have different tax impacts, but certainly in terms of uh, minimizing the corporation tax that needs to be paid, the best opportunity is to make sure that the overdrawn loan amount is cleared within nine months of the, the year end. The next point I'd like to look at is capital allowance claims on buildings. Now, in, in terms of a building itself, obviously the, there's no tax deduction for the actual building, but where we find that there can be opportunities is by moving some of the costs that were in a, included in the purchase of the building and identifying them as fixtures and fittings or plant and machinery. And that then means that they're eligible for capital allowances, which can be claimed. Now, we've had some success with this. We, we use a specialized company who actually uh, does the, the surveying of the building, and they go around and they do a, a physical audit of the, the actual assets, and then help us make the, the claim to basically transfer some of the cost of the property into the, the fixtures and fittings. There's a couple of changes that have, have taken place over the, the last couple of years in terms of this area. So from April 2012, the seller and purchaser have to agree the disposal price of the fixtures within two years of the sale, and they basically do that by making an election. Uh, for purchases of property from April 2014, uh, the seller is going to have to pool any of the expenditure, so really the, it needs to be identified prior to the, the sale. However, that can also make it more valuable, uh, the property potentially more valuable for the, the seller. The uh, penultimate one is uh, looking at associated companies and groups. So again, the, because the tax rate is actually closing between the, the main rate and the lower rate, in the past it was sometimes uh, not necessarily beneficial for companies to be associated uh, because that meant that the, the rate at which they were being charged on their profits was being reduced. So for instance, if there was two associated companies Instead of 300,000 being the, the rate where they moved into the marginal rate band, it was 150,000 pounds for each company. Uh, so the, the, there was often reasons why to try and keep companies apart. Uh, as the rates are actually closing uh, and they're narrowing and the, the main rate and the, the lower rate are going to be the same uh, in the next couple of years, then there can be benefits from, from having an associated companies and particularly uh, having a group structure. So within a, an actual group then you can offset losses and profits. You don't necessarily have to do any management recharging within the group to do that. They are just offset in the actual corporation tax returns. And also movements of assets between the, the companies can be done without any capital gain. Uh, so although in the, the past we may have had to look at whether the, the actual profitability of the individual companies would have taken one into a, a higher rate tax bracket once they, they were associated, then because of the, the convergence of the rates, that's much less of an issue going forward. So if you have more than one company and they're not already in a group, then it may well be worth having a look at that situation and looking at the potential construction of a, a group for the businesses. Our final one is just on specific provisions, uh, so it's a bit more technical accounting. The big difference is that if you make a general provision in your accounts, it's not tax deductible. So for instance, if you said that 
in general, we have 10,000 pounds of bad debts every year, but we can't identify against which business that's going to be, then that wouldn't be tax deductible. However, specific provisions are tax deductible. So taking the bad debt example, if you were able to say, okay, we have two or three debtors where it's an old debt, we don't think it's going to be collected, and these total £10,000, then that would become a, a deductible expense for corporation tax because it's specific to individual debt rather than just a general provision. i put down another couple of common ones that we can look at. So credit note provisions, here what we'd be looking at is that if there's been credit notes which have been issued after the year end, uh, but actually relate to work that was done prior to the, the year end, then that can be taken into account as a, a cost. And if you have stock, then obsolete and slow moving stock uh, are other areas where provisions can be considered. And I've, I've got a brief example on the, the stock in the next slide. So we've got five stock items there, just with uh, the quantities, what the unit values are, and uh, the stock values at the year end. Now for D4, what we're saying is that we held a proportionately large quantity of stock in comparison to the amount of units that were being sold. When we look at that, that's effectively four years' worth of stock. So it would be entirely reasonable to say that, okay, we don't believe that all of that stock is going to be sold in the future because we have a, in this instance we've said there's a, a competitor which has introduced a, a more advanced uh, competitor product and so some of the value of our stock is effectively going to be scrapped or written off at some point in the future. So as a suggested provision we've said 75% of the stock holding over one year uh, and that would equate to £12,825. So that would go through the accounts as a, a cost, and again, that would reduce the, the corporation tax provision. Now, in terms of that, if, it, if something changed and the stock was effectively sold, potentially it's maybe sold in a batch, then the provision would be released at some point in the future, which would increase the profits and the tax would be paid at that point. Uh, but it's certainly a way of, of deferring that tax liability and taking it as early as possible in terms of the relief that's given. So I uh, hope you've enjoyed our, our presentation. It's been fairly short. Uh, it certainly doesn't cover all the areas, but hopefully it potentially gives you some ideas and you know, hopefully some new ideas that you maybe haven't thought about in the, the past. We're always keen to speak to people directly, so if you like what you've seen, the contact details are, are down there. Please give us a call or drop us an email. Thank you very much.